All right, so in the last video, we, we talked a bit about partial derivatives and these different differentiability classes, so C0, C1, C2, in particular, uh, C1 meaning that your partial, your first order partial derivatives exist and they're continuous. And I mentioned that existence of those, or continuity of those first order partial derivatives implies that your function is differentiable. So differentiability, let's spell that right, there we go. Um, so what does it actually mean for a function to be differentiable in more than one variable, right? Um, so we can, we can start by thinking about what differentiability looks like in a single variable, right? So in one variable, well, okay, we've already seen in one of the previous videos, we've seen, we've seen that this, this notion uh, of the, that the derivative exists, uh, right, you know, by the usual kind of uh, difference quotient uh, limit definition. Um, this doesn't translate well, right? This, uh, this doesn't extend nicely to, to two or more variables. Okay, so we have to think back on Calc 1 and, and think about some other ways of, of saying what it means for a function to be differentiable, right? So what does it mean for a function to have a derivative? Um, well, having a derivative means that you have a, a tangent line, right? So you have a tangent um, line which gives you this linear approximation. Um, and this turns out to be the right way to go. Um, we, I briefly mentioned in the video on, on interpreting partial derivatives that, you know, for a function of two variables, if you graph it, you get a surface, and you can use the partial derivatives to construct this idea of a tangent plane at a point, right, which you would think should give you the linear approximation to the, to the surface. Um, and so this will work, right? So think about what does, what does the linear approximation at a point look like, right? So the linear approximation at some a, remember what this looks like. It looks like f of a plus f prime of a times, times x minus a. Uh, and one of the things that you might do if we, you know, I mean, we know this is the answer. But one of the things that you could do to kind of, you know, lead to how you might think about doing this in more than one variable is you might say, well, you know, maybe, maybe we don't yet know about this f prime of a. Let's just call this m. It's some slope. It's a number, right? It gives me the slope of this line. And so let's say I just write down any particular, so, so really, once I put in that m, this would be sort of the generic equation um, for a line you know, if I graph this, I get a line through the point A, F of A, with the slope of M, right? Okay, um, now, how would I determine what slope was the best slope? What slope gives me the best approximation? Uh, this is where, this is where you can kind of say, well, what does it mean to have a good approximation? It means that the difference between this function and your original function should be small, and that difference should get smaller the closer x is to a. Um, so what we really say is that a good approximation, or, or maybe I should say the best approximation, is going to be the one that satisfies the following limit condition. The limit as h goes to zero of f of a plus h minus l at a at a plus h. So the difference between those two functions as we approach the point um, divided by h. So I mean, I guess as sort of a first 
condition, we should say, well, the difference should go to zero. But in fact, what we want to say is that not only does this difference go to zero, right? Because the difference is going to go to zero for any value of m. Um, you can check that. It's, you know, if I just if I ignore the h, uh, the difference is going to be zero as h goes to zero. But I, that's not good enough. What I want is this difference to go to zero and to go to zero, kind of, you know, roughly order h squared. It's going to zero faster than h is going to zero, right? So if I divide by h, still. This limit gives me zero, even though h is also going to zero. Um, we could also write this, if you want, the other way you could write this limit would be the limit as x goes to a of f of x minus l a of x over, over x minus a. Either one is, is equivalent, right? Um, but then if you sort of unpack this, if you start plugging things in, you say, well, what, what do I really have in this limit? This limit is really the limit as h goes to 0. If I plug in what my linear approximation is, well, I have, I have f at a plus h minus f at a minus this part. You know, let's, well, let's just put it as m for now. Why not? m times, well, if I put x equal to a plus h, I'll get a plus h minus a, the a's cancel, I just get m times h, okay? All over h. Uh, and then of course, if I were to choose to, to group things like that, well, you can see here, if I do f of a plus h minus f of a over h, there's, there's your usual derivative, right? And then m times h over h, that's just m, right? So I could split it up like that, and so if I, if I want this limit to be zero, you can see that I'm going to need, I'm sort of forced to have m equal to what we usually define as f prime of a. Turns out this idea works in general, um, right? So we'll, I'll, I'll do it here for a function of two variables, a real valued function of two variables. Um, but you can generalize beyond that. You can do this in general for functions from Rn to Rm. We just have to think a little bit about, well, what do you replace? So m is just a number. What does that number get replaced with as you go up in dimension, right? So, so let's think about two variables. Okay. So we have, let's say, z equals f of x, y, right? And we're going to consider this at some point a, b. Uh, so one of the things that you can work out, and we, we kind of, we put most of the ingredients for this on a, on a previous video, and we're going to do examples in class, so let me just kind of say, you know, what does the tangent plane look like? So the tangent plane at this point, it looks like this. It looks like um, z equals f of a b plus the x derivative at a b times x minus a plus the y derivative at a b times y minus b. Okay. That's the equation for the tangent plane uh, to this surface at this point. All right. Well, just like we do in one variable where we say, well, if I had y equal to this, that's my tangent line, and I take the right-hand side of that and make that my linear approximation, um, this whole thing here, we'll call that maybe LAB, and notice that it's a function of x and y. Um, this is going to be my linear approximation, right? Okay, so differentiability should mean that, well, I mean, at the bare minimum, this thing needs to exist, right? Um, but again, you might kind of, you know, maybe you're in this same sort of scenario that we had over here where um, pretend we don't know these numbers in advance, and this is just some... Um, let's see, I've got to think of letters I haven't used yet. 
uh, maybe capital A, capital B. And you say, well, I want this to be, I want this to be a good approximation. I want it to be, you know, the best possible linear approximation for my function. And, and we say, well, what, that, what does that mean? Well, again, saying it's a best approximation, should mean that the difference between this linear function and the original function, that difference should go to zero. And, and again, um, notice that if, if I just did the difference, that's going to go to zero for any choice of values for a and b, okay? But I don't just want it to go to zero, I want it to go to zero faster than the distance between x, y, and a, b. So saying I have a best approximation, well, it, it looks something like this. It looks like saying that the limit as, well now I need not just an h, maybe an h and a k, so h, k goes to 0, 0 of f of a plus h, b plus k minus l at a plus h B plus K. I want that difference to go to zero, and I want it to still go to zero after I divide by the magnitude of H squared plus K squared. Right? I want that limit to be zero. Um, but again, if you think about what you're dealing with here, what does this, uh, what does this limit actually look like? Um, H, oops h k goes to zero zero. If I if I unpack this, I've got a plus h, b plus k, minus f at a b. Minus, uh, let's just call it a for now. So a plus h minus a. So this is going to be capital A times h minus capital B times K over the square root of H squared plus K squared, right? I want that to be zero, right? Um, and, and by the way, one of the things sometimes, uh, just to kind of simplify your life, um, you, might, you might throw in um, absolute values around this. Um, I'll point out why in a second. Uh, all right, so I mean, if the absolute value goes to zero, so does the thing inside the absolute value. Um, and partly this just comes from playing around with like epsilon delta proofs and things like that. Uh, now, this is a limit in two variables. How do you make sense of it? Well, you know, if I'm saying that limit should be zero, I'm, I'm telling you that the limit exists, right? So that limit exists um, and it's zero. And if the limit exists, that means I should be able to get zero no matter what path I choose for letting HK going to zero, zero, right? And, and if you went along, so let's say I go along K equal to zero, right? So what happens if, uh, if, if I go along K equal to zero? Well then, that's gone, and, and that's gone, and that's gone, right? And, and then you would basically just have this. You would have the absolute value of f of a plus h, um, o and b, minus f at a, b, over h, right? Minus, well, that's just going to be h over h. You're going to get, uh, you know, basically you're going to get a here. There's a little bit of maybe worrying about absolute values, but more or less it boils down to this, right? And, and so you want this to be zero, and of course, this bit here, when you take the limit as h goes to zero, that's exactly the limit definition for the partial derivative uh, with respect to x. So a has to be the partial derivative with respect to x. Uh, similarly, if you, if you approach along the path where h is zero, and then let k go to zero, um, then this over here is going to give you the partial derivative with respect to y, 
and it's going to have to equal to b, right? Um, so you, you can play this same game and realize that, yeah, okay, the best linear approximation does come from this tangent plane equation, uh, provided that my function is differentiable. So this is one way to define what it means to be differentiable, is that there exist numbers a and b that make this limit zero, and if those numbers exist, they have no choice but to be the two partial derivatives. Um, so this is one way you can define what it means for a function to be differentiable in more than one variable. Uh, you'll find a slightly different definition in the textbook, but it is, it is equivalent to this one. Um, this is, is a little bit more complicated looking at first, but the reason I'm giving you this is that it does extend to a lot of cases that aren't necessarily considered in the book. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that later on.